As Berkshire Hathaway heads into its annual shareholder meeting this weekend in Omaha, shareholders are bound to be happy. Both classes of the company's shares are up nearly 11 percent this year, compared to just a 2 percent gain for the S&P 500. Few investors in the world are as successful as Warren Buffett. So author and investment analyst Jeremy Miller has compiled more than 30 letters Buffett wrote to his business partners in the 1950s and 60s and assembled this timeless investment know-how into a book. Warren Buffett's Ground Rules. And Jeremy Miller joins us now to discuss. Welcome, Jeremy. Great to have you. Great to be here. Congrats on the book. And you also have a Market Watch article out today about one of the principles that Warren Buffett holds dear. You say we can all benefit from this. And that is, this is the principle of compa compound interest, correct? That's right. That's right. So it's interest upon interest. It's really something that requires a long-term uh, mindset. It, it doesn't really kick in for, you know, five to 10 years, uh, right. really. But once it does, it's the most powerful force in investing. And, and that's what Buffett would say. And he's certainly known for having that long-term mindset. He has one letter specifically about market swings. What were his thoughts about that? He, he writes, our job is to pile up yearly advantages over the performance of the Dow without worrying too much about how the absolute results in a given year are a plus or minus. He thinks that as long as he's beating the Dow, even if he's down, he's doing better than if he's on par with the Dow, right? That's right. And, and the analogy he uses is a duck floating on the pond. So a duck doesn't get any credit for its altitude if the water level goes up and shouldn't get penalized if the water goes down. The duck should be evaluated on how well it flaps its wings, right. right? So Buffett wants to be judged on how he does relative to the market because in any given year, you never know. Right. And now in another letter, he talks about risk and how he defines risk. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. I think it's a great uh, way of thinking that he offers to investors because a lot of times people equate risk with quantitative measures, beta, or the amount of stock squiggles on a given day. And uh, that's not how he thinks about it at all. He thinks risk is not knowing what you're doing. If you don't understand the company that you're invested in, when those inevitable drops in the market come, you're apt to get scared out of your position. That's why the average investor earns far less per year than you know the overall averages tend to give you. Right, which is a good point because we know that he was a strong proponent of, of index funds, correct? I mean, reading his will in your book made me think, oh my goodness, unless I'm investing in Berkshire Hathaway, maybe I should just be an index funds, right? Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the big point is, you know, you can't get anything out of the market that you don't put into it. In other words, if you're not willing to do the work to look and invest in the individual companies or find the right manager for you, then you really should just buy the index. Mm -hmm. um, but he is an active investor. So right. for him and for others who are willing to put the work in, you know, there's great benefits. Back to the point on compounding, if you just get an extra couple points versus the, the market a year over the long term, that really adds up. Makes too. a big difference, absolutely. Now, what was his view on cheap stocks? He has a letter on this as well. So, you know, Buffett came out of Columbia, went to work for Ben Graham. He's really the best student of Ben's. And he started as a real Grahamite, you know, buying super cheap stocks, statistical bargains. And through the partnership era, you know, this is 1956 to 1970, we really start to see his migration towards quality compounders, things like American Express, Disney. Those are the kind of companies he was buying at the end. Very different than the ultra cheap, what he would call cigar butts, you know, the one free puff left, right. you know, but it's free. But did he? But he obviously looked into these companies and knew they weren't cheap because of fundamental issues with the company. Correct? Well, he looked at them and he saw that there was more value in the business than um, than than what was uh, reflected in the security price. Right. Right. So it was a bad business, but it was a price as an awful business. Right. So if he could just play the awful to bad, yes. he could make money. But he'd have to move on from those. It was kind of like a treadmill for him. And all of these lessons still apply today, right? These are from letters that he wrote in the 50s and 60s, but nothing's really changed. That's right. That's right. You know, that's why The Intelligent Investor remains, you know, a top 100 business book, you know, and that's even older. That's because the lessons in, in the letters are are really principles based. Right. They're not tactics. Tactics change. Principles are sort of, you know, and, forever. And speaking of principles, how telling is it that Warren Buffett does not charge the 2 and 20 fee structure that so many hedge funds do charge and that he has as much skin in the game as his investors? 
I think it's a very noble structure. You know, he's really made uh, great efforts to align himself with his partners. He's always looked at uh, his investors, his shareholders as his partners. And, you know, by aligning his interests with theirs, you know, it goes back to the partnership era. The first partners were his aunt, his mm -hmm. brother-in-law, um, you know, his college roommate. So, you know, he, was, he treats his partners like he treats his family. Absolutely. Jerry, Jeremy Miller, thank you so much for this insight into the Oracle of Omaha. We loved it. Thanks so much for that. Thank you.